Good afternoon. My name is Mitchie Reed, and I am with the Gainesville Business History Project, a collection of oral history interviews conducted with business leaders from Gainesville, Florida. Today is April 11th, 2024, and I am interviewing Patrick Lavery, the owner and founder of High Dive, a bar and music venue in Gainesville, Florida. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, just say your full name uh, for us so we know how to pronounce it. Patrick Lavery. Patrick Lavery. Okay, Lavery. Got it. Uh, thank you. And I was wondering if you could just say what businesses you manage or work for in Gainesville. Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> I own uh, High Dive, uh, which is a music venue. And then um, I also own uh, Glory Days Presents, which is a you know, concert and event promotions company. Okay. And uh, would you be able to tell me a little bit about your history with High Dive? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. Do you, do you think, I, I was thinking maybe we should uh, uh, start with uh, personal history a little bit because it, you know, kind of leads into to the whole thing because, you know, uh, High Dive is kind of like, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, many chapters along. For sure. Uh, you can definitely start by telling me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, you know, I, I uh, uh, you know, I, I would say the, the whole journey started uh, uh, about thirty years ago. Um, I was, uh, you know, a high school kid who was just getting into uh, rock music, and um, you know, the recent anniversary kind of reminded me of it is, uh, you know, Kurt Cobain died. That was uh, April '94, and, and now we're in April 2024. But um, when that happened. It just kind of um, really jump started my interest in uh, in, in rock music, uh, and um, you know I, was, I would honestly say from there from that point on I was obsessed, and um, I uh, uh, <clears throat> I really wanted to uh, get into radio at the time. At that you know at that time radio was like the gatekeeper for a lot of music. That's how I found out about a lot of uh, uh, new bands at the time. And um, I, uh, uh, I think it was maybe 1996, 1997, I, um, I went to a, uh, a festival that a radio station uh, in South Florida put together. Um, it was uh, WZTA, so that's, uh, they were called Zeta. And uh, they put together a, a festival, and uh, there was a band on the show that uh, was from Gainesville. And uh, they were called Sabrosa, mm. and they um, originally were a band called For Squirrels, which um, broke on the radio in like '96, and they had a really tragic story. You know, they they got signed to Sony Music out of Gainesville. They you know recorded a record. They were just getting ready to put out their record, and they were driving home from Gainesville. Uh, from New York, he got in this awful van accident. Uh, several of the members died, um, and then the, the record came out like I don't know, a couple weeks later, a couple months later, very very soon after. And um, you know, they promoted the record, went out and toured its first worlds, changed their name to Sabrosa, and um, you know, I saw them in 1997 in, in South Florida, where I was growing up, going to high school at the time, and. Um, I was really interested in, in seeing them because I I knew the band for Squirrels. I'd heard them on the radio, and um, while they were playing, uh, the singer threw his guitar out into the crowd. Um, I happened to catch this guitar, um, <laughs> yeah, and um, was just like thought that was just the coolest thing that ever happened. Um, ended up um, uh, a couple months later. Did you uh, did, right before I did? Did you so get I, to keep the guitar? Yes, I did. Um, so, you know, like I said, they were signed to Sony. Uh, they, the band, you know, they had extra money at the time. <laughs> yeah. was, I think it was a <laughs> guitar they had bought at a pawn shop or something. And, uh, yeah, they, they saw it as disposable. You get to remember, too, again, at that time, you know, Kurt Cobain, like, what did he do after a lot of his shows? He, he destroyed his guitars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that band, you know, I came to find out later they were, you know, very influenced. Well, I, I didn't, don't even have to... Uh, uh, they're, the big song that that band had on the radio was a song called Mighty KC, which was written about Kurt Cobain. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, they threw the guitar out. I caught it. I kept it. Um, 
They came back and played again, uh, I want to say August of 97, okay? And then I, at a smaller club uh, down in South Florida called the Button South, I went to see them. There, you know, there was maybe 50, 75 people. They had a lot of people. I brought the guitar, had the band signed it, sign it. I don't even think I knew necessarily that they were from Gainesville, or maybe I just found this out, but I was getting ready to go to school uh, at UF, uh, you know, a couple weeks later. I said, hey, you know, I'm going to school. I got this guitar. They're like, you know, they signed it for me. It was a cool, uh, uh, just serendipitous kind of thing. And um, I came to Gainesville, just uh, kind of got immersed in the music scene from that band, you know, because I was just like so into them. They were like my new favorite band. And um, I would go and see them, you know, pretty much every month um, at a club called the Tupper Dish, which is or was in the building where High Dive is now. Oh. Um, so, so High Dive kind of started as, well, in the 80s, it was like, you know, uh, at the time they would have called it a gay disco. Um, it was like the first, like, gay club in, in Gainesville um, at the time. And then uh, in the early 90s, it became the covered dish. And um, I would go see Sabrosa there uh, from, like, 97 to 2000. Saw them almost every month they would play there and I saw them and bands like Less Than Jake and Hot Word Music and you know uh, all these bands that came out of Gainesville at that time um, and then the Covered Dish closed um, and well and we'll back up but when when it was Covered Dish I became the flyer guy there um, I was you know I would go around uh, in between classes and after classes um, and hang up flyers on the bulletin boards and on the telephone poles uh, we would tape them to telephone poles, uh, and um, so I did that for, I think, I want to say like the last uh, year or so that Covered Dish was open, and uh, and then it closed, I want to say January 2000, right around the time that I graduated from UF, um, and, um, you know, I also was kind of delving into the music industry more at the time. I was, I was, I had some friends in a band that I would travel with and kind of learned to roadie a little bit. I was doing concert photography at the time. Um, I was, I started booking shows for, for bands. Um, I started a booking agency. I started becoming a promoter. Um, at the time I, uh, early 2000s, I want to say like 2002, 2003, um, I started glory days. Um, you know, just booking shows that for bands that I would go see at clubs. I mean, I was going to shows constantly. Um, and I say about my time um, at Covered Dish, um, one of the biggest benefits of working there was that I got to go to the club all the time for free, um, <laughs> which was great because I was going there all the time anyway. Um, you know, I was going there a lot anyway, but then now it was free. I was there like every night. So, um, you know, I kind of uh, say that I got like my, my um, like, <laughs> I got my degree in underground music, <laughs> you know, going to, to cover dish like just learning the underground music scene you you're you know this is still like very early days of the internet so um you know i just learned about bands from from the bands that were playing there and you know you would walk into the club and there would be like a bulletin board there with like all the band's bios and and the calendar of the bands coming up and you're just sifting through it and you're just digesting all of it and you're reading the band's bios and then they're talking about their influences and then you know you're just you're just building this encyclopedic knowledge of, of bands and you're checking out new bands and you go to the record store and you listen to them and you buy the records and stuff. That's how you, you know, it, it was, it was uh, the same thing as like Spotify is now where you can just constantly try out new bands, but there was a lot more effort that you had to put into it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of how I got involved in the music scene. I started a promotions company, uh, Glory Days Presents, like I said, around tw 2002, 2003, I can't remember exactly. Um, and then, uh, you know, I started getting, uh, you know, uh, jobs here and there, like booking clubs or booking nights at clubs, um, uh, in that early 2000s timeframe. And, um, you know, I feel like I, I probably, I, you know, I would, it, the pattern was like, I, I would come in, you know, there'd be a club that wasn't doing well, someone quit, whatever they need, they didn't want to book put effort into booking the shows. I booked shows there on particular nights or whatever. And then, you know, inevitably all these clubs closed because, you know, that's just the cycle of, of, of clubs in Gainesville. So there was a club uh, called 
uh, full circle, which is where uh, the um, uh, where the arcade bar is now. Mm -hmm. I booked shows there for a bit. Uh, then there was a club. Well, then there was Market Street Pub, which is where um, Spurred Up Saloon is now. Um, I, I started booking shows there like fall 2003, and that's where like things really started to take off for me and because it was a, a, bigger, a bigger venue. And, do, and you think, um, do you think that that cycle of clubs closing is unique to Gainesville, or do you think it's kind of everywhere? Uh, it's a little bit everywhere, but it's also very um, you know prevalent in like college towns. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you because you know as we know, like a lot of the musicians are are in college. They come and go a lot, you know, so bands don't last very long. And then, you know, you have the summer. The summer is always tough because, you know, college kids go and get internships. They go and travel and, and uh, or they go back and live with their home, their, their parents for the summer or whatever. And so there's just, like, less of a talent pool to draw from. There's less people to go out to shows in the summer. You know, touring bands are afraid to stop in the summer because of, of those reasons. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's, so it's hard for a club to stay open when, you know, uh, May, June, you know, a, a quarter of the year or a third of the year, actually May, June, July, yeah, uh, a, a third of the year, you know, you have a diminished, uh, a talent and a customer pool. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, Gainesville has grown a lot since in 20 years and that's helped sustain a lot of these businesses. But, you know, it was just, like, a really hard struggle back then. Um, and, you know, and it's also, like, uh, you know, bands didn't tour as much back then either because it was, like, you know, it was it was as the, the music industry was uh, transitioning from, you know, into streaming and, and there was Napster and everything. And so now, you know, bands tour a lot more now because that's their main source of income, whereas at that time, there, you know, there were bands that were still, you know, making money off records. Um so, yeah, I worked at a lot of clubs that, that opened and closed, um, but things really took off for me um, at a place called Market Street Pub. Um, you know, it was a room, a venue that held, like, four to 500 people, and so we were, I was able to start, like, booking a lot of the shows that used to come to the Covered Dish, but the Covered Dish had closed in, in 2000 and um, had been replaced by a dance club, uh, a couple of different dance clubs um, during that time period. And um, so I kind of started like trying to fill that void and bring a lot of those bands back to Gainesville and um, started to get a little um, uh, success with it. Um, and it, I believe it was January 20, uh, 2004, I booked my first, well, fall of, 20, of 2003, I booked my first like national touring band. It was this band called the Dave Brocky Experience, which was members of Guar, but without their makeup on. <laughs> um, <laughs> And right, so so you know, it, it, I think sixty, seventy people came out. Um, I think I literally had like thirty dollars left over after I paid all the all the bands and the expenses and everything. And it was like, woo, this is exciting! Like, let's go buy a pizza over at Five Star to celebrate, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and and uh, you know, yeah, I just kind of got hooked on it from there, as far as like promoting shows and just the excitement of of um, you know, the, like the, there was a creative outlet there because. Um, you know, like I said, I, I really wanted to be in the radio. When I came to Gainesville, I, I, I worked in radio for a little bit, um, uh, which was a way for me to kind of get into the music scene a little bit. But I learned to, learned really quickly that, you know, radio is not actually not a very creative place. Like, I went into it thinking, oh, you get to choose, you know, I'm going to be a DJ and I'm going to choose all the music that I play. Well, as, as I learned very quickly, like, that's not the case, right? Especially in, in corporate radio. Um, mm -hmm. And so I didn't do that for very long. But booking shows, um, to me, was a way more crea creative outlet. It was like, I do get to choose the music that plays, um, albeit it's a different format, right? So, you know, I, I, I was, you know, it was, it was an exciting time. I, I, had, I had an opportunity to book um, a lot of cool bands. January 2024, I had my first sold-out show. Uh, or I keep saying 2024, 2004. Um, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was about to say. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, like it's, it's, uh, I mean, it, literally, I'm talking about 20 plus years now in the music industry. Um, but uh, yeah, January of 2004, I booked my first sold out show, which was Guided by Voices at Market Street Pub. And, um, you know, it was just like, like I remember people were very excited. That band has a very, like, cult following. 
Mm-hmm. So people were very excited. Uh, you know, the show was really well attended. Um, it was a bit of an adventure because, uh, uh, you know, that was, I think, one of my first times dealing with, like, a rider, a band having a rider. And um, and on that rider, I think, was 20, 25 cases of Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> Which at the time, I thought that was normal. I was like, this is why people went on the rider. Um, but, you know, it was basically the, the singer just would drink Bud Light all night long while he was playing. And then they had, you know, essentially a cooler right next to him on the stage. And, uh, you know, he had like a group of friends that would sit there and drink, help him drink the cooler from the cooler. <laughs> so they went, they went through all this Bud Light that night. And, um, you know, again, that was, you know, my introduction to like, you know, a, a big, you know, in my mind, a big touring show, you that, know, 500 people. That wasn't even a hospitality rider. That was for the performance. <laughs> it it kind of was. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. It was. It was part of the performance. Um, and, um, yeah, things just took off from there quickly. Like, you know, I, I just, it, it, it snowballed, and I was able to book more and more shows, bring more stuff in. And, and at the time, that was, you know, I want to say it was one of the biggest venues that was available in Gainesville. Um uh, there was the Florida Theater that was still kind of open, um, but it was transitioning into more of a dance club um, mm-hmm. at that time. Um, and uh, there was a place called Common Grounds that was open. It was a little coffee shop that was down on um, uh, University Avenue, uh, kind of near where the subway is. Um, it was 919 West University Avenue, so I think that's probably 9th Street and University. Um uh, it's, it's, it, it's since been torn down. It was, uh, it was, uh, it's condos now, uh, yeah. like a lot of things in Gainesville. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, that was Common Grounds. And they had been starting to bring some of those bands in that had played at Covered Dish, but, you know, they were too small. I mean, I think the legal capacity of there was, like, 120 people. But, I mean, they were, sh- they were shoving two to 300 people in there some nights. Um, <laughs> I remember a time I actually saw, uh, well, actually, I, did, I didn't even see them, um, I, I heard him. I heard Frank Black uh, from the Pixies playing there, you know, playing a Pixie song. But I was out on the sidewalk listening to it <laughs> because I couldn't even get in. Uh, there were so <laughs> many people. But so, so when, when, when I started booking shows at Market Street Pub with Glory Days Presents, uh, you know, we had a bigger venue. You know, b- bands were drawn to that. We started um, getting some shows in there it was exciting i mean and i can even talk about uh, some of the shows we almost had which were like modest mouse and death cab uh for cutie um that just never worked out but um you know i mean we booked early shows for like bands like bayside um uh geez who else um uh Soja, that was a band uh, we booked early shows for. I mean, I, I, I literally would could go. I could go back and, and look and, and pull up a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know the, the shows at the time. Uh, but um, you know, we we, we started to, to build up the music scene a little bit because when the covered dish closed, there was kind of a lull and things had to uh, kind of get re- reestablished. A lot of bands stopped coming um, after the, uh, that place closed, and then. Um, in 2000, I want to say four or five, um, the co- Common Grounds, they moved to the the covered the old covered dish spot. And, um, you know, uh, eventually I started promoting shows there. Like I said, maybe 2006-ish, I started promoting shows there. And, uh, again, you know, as we booked more and more shows there, um, uh, you know, we just got more opportunities. I mean, I booked uh, bands like Mayday Parade and uh, Streetlight Manifesto, um, mm-hmm. which, um, and, uh, you know, but and, and those are bands. Well, and then also, side note, when Common Grounds moved out of their space on University Avenue, it became another club called 1982 Bar, and I booked shows there for a while. I actually booked Mayday Parade and Streetlight Manifesto there first um, in that smaller venue before they moved up to the bigger venue, at Common Grounds, um, which which is now in the space where High Dive will eventually open, right? Um, uh, and um, yeah, it, it, things were just a natural progression over time. You know, I I was just you know very uh, motivated to just book bigger and bigger shows and 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 grow my business as as much as possible uh, because it's just you know exciting. It's a big rush um, of just more you know bigger bands, more people. Um, you know, bigger opportunities, um, 
And so, you know, I, I started uh, booking those shows at Common Grounds and got to the point um, there where I started booking a lot of their bigger national acts there. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing about Common Grounds is they were like, uh, at that time, the, the kind of the biggest influence in the local music scene was like the No Idea Records punk crowd. And they, you know, like bands like Against Me were kind of blowing up at that time. Um, and, you know, they were like very focused on serving that crowd. That was like their bread and butter, their regular people. And then I was coming in with like, with shows that appealed to just like a totally different crowd. So it was a good balance at the time. Um, where, you know, they, they, they were catering to that one crowd. I was bringing in these different shows to kind of diversify the, the their, their lineups. Um, because one thing about, uh, you know, venues and, and programming a venue and booking a venue is that if you try to hit the same crowd every night and get the same crowd to come to your, your venue every night, you're going to burn them out. <laughs> they, they just can't like yeah. come all the, all the time. <laughs> um, and you know, it, you, you can, you know, especially in a, a, a building that size, uh, you, you really do have to draw from a bigger pool of people um, to stay open, you know, because you have, you know, you have high expenses. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I was doing that. In 2008, I actually put on a music festival uh, with Glory Days. It was called The Real Big Deal. Um, it actually, in, in my, you know, uh, from my standpoint, it turned out to be kind of a real big flop. Um, you know, I essentially invested all the money that I had ever made uh, booking shows up to that point <laughs> into doing this <laughs> festival, um, which you know I would never do again now. But at the time when I was, uh, I say I was about 29, 28, 29 at that time, uh, seemed like a great idea. You know, it seemed like the next natural progression uh, in my business, and I, you know, I thought we could pull it off. And in some ways, we did. I mean, it happened. Uh, you know, a lot of people had a great a great time, but it did lose a lot of money. I essentially lost all the money that I put into it, um, but I, it actually it also helped uh, my business grow at the time. I felt uh, because we were just getting more and more show opportunities. Um, at that time, I started uh, uh, you know booking shows in other markets in Florida. Uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier on, for, for a while I had a booking agency, so I was booking tours for bands, and I was promoting the shows for bands. And I want to say I did that for, you know, five, six years, seven years. Um, but it got to the point where the the booking agency um, kind of was a lot more work for a lot less return. Yeah. Um, it, because, you know, I didn't have, like, really big bands. I had a lot of smaller bands that were still developing. Um, and, you know, and, and I was essentially calling other promoters and being like, hey, book this show. And I'm relying on them to, to, to you know, make, the sh- make it a good show. And, you know, it didn't always work out. Um, and, you know, I liked the control part of being a promoter more. Where, where I felt like I had more control over my destiny of how well the show is going to turn out in the end. And, um, you know, <clears throat> it was just a better investment of my time uh, to do that. Uh, so I kind of got rid of the bookie agency and, um, uh, and focused just on being a promoter. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, excuse me, uh, I did the festival, um, I, I started uh, I, when I when I stopped doing the booking agency. I took a lot of the contacts I had from booking shows out, outside of Gainesville as a booking agent, and and turned those into uh, contacts of people that I would book shows without the promoter. So um, I started booking shows in Tallahassee, and Pensacola, and Tampa, um, Orlando, uh, with with people that um, uh, you know I had booked. Uh, shows with on my booking agency roster, but now we were co-promoting the, sh- the shows um, in all these different cities, and it just turned out to be a really good thing because now when a band uh, comes to Florida, I can say, well, I have all these different uh, cities uh, that we can we can book shows in, and yeah. um, you know things just you know really progress exponentially from there. Just having more uh, volume and more uh, control over. Uh, 
the, you know, my destiny, I guess I would say, which is, okay, I really like this band. They want to play in Gainesville. Oh, hey, by the way, let's book these other shows too. And then we start routing bands uh, through Florida. They have more reason to come to Florida because I can give them more shows. Um, you know, I would say at that time, uh, the, you know, just the local music scene or, or just the, the Florida music scene wasn't built up as much. It was harder to get people to come here. Um, and so, and, and in a lot of ways, I didn't even know what venues were available or, or they didn't have a whole lot of confidence that the shows would be a success. So here comes someone that's like, Hey, do these markets. And then I'm going to make sure that they're a success. I think that helped, you know, with, with getting more bands here. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it was a mutually beneficial thing. They did well, I did well. And, um, you know, I was chugging along doing that. And then in 2011, uh, the folks from Common Grounds, you know, I had a good working relationship with them. I was booking a lot of the national talent coming through their venue. Um, they, I, I remember I was in Pensacola doing a show, and they hit me up and said, hey, you know, when are you going to be back in town? Like, we want to talk to you about something. And I was like, oh, okay, um, you know, I'll be back in a couple of days. You know, is everything okay? And they said, okay, yeah, well, when you get back, we'll talk. So we had a meeting. They said, hey, listen, um, you know, we're we're done with this place you know it's run its course for us and you know uh but we wanted to continue to stay open as you know the music uh, the mu a music venue because we know how important this venue is to the um the the health of the local music scene yeah. because like i said you know common or, or the covered dish had closed in 2000 and there was this gap for several years where you know there there wasn't like a steady music venue uh, in town um, that could bring in you know big national acts, and um, th you know they didn't want to see that happen again. Uh, they didn't want to see that lull in the music scene that had happened in uh, in the early two thousands, and and I and, you know I knew that as well. Um, so I said, wow, um, you know I don't I don't know if I'm cut out for this, but um, well, first thing I said was, are, are you sure? Um, what if I lent you some money? <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was like, I don't want to run this place. Uh, I, I, I enjoy booking shows here. I was, you know, a large portion of my business um, is done here as far as book, booking shows. But do I really want to run this place? I never had imagined I would, I would run a venue yeah, or own a venue or, or anything like that. I just, you know. I mean, hell, I hadn't even imagined I would be a show promoter when it happened. Um, it was something that just happened, you know. Um, I didn't even know that that there was a job called a concert promoter. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, fell into it. Um, so when that happened, I was like, and they said, no, you know, we're done with this. We want you, you know, we think you're the, the best person to take this place over. And, <laughs> okay. And uh, b before you get into that chapter. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Gainesville because Gainesville is not, uh, it's gotten bigger, but it's certainly not a big city. Um, yep. And yet I feel like more than any other city its size, certainly in Florida, it has a reputation for producing a lot of bands. Like yep. even, even removing the Tom Petty outlier, yep. you still have like Dikembe and Less Than Jake and... And so many good acts. I was I, Hot Water Music and Against Me, and um, uh, you know, all the you know, like I said, there was a, a large period of time where No Idea was a big influence. Exactly. And there were a lot of bands, uh, No Idea, that um, that ended up touring uh, with Hot Water Music, with Less Than Jake, and, and building up, and you know, going overseas and everything else. And then you know, more recently, bands like Flip Turn and, and The Hales, who have kind of sprouted out of high dive. Um, mm -hmm. But yes. Gainesville, you know, that, this is a very good question because when I, you know, I grew up in, in West Palm Beach, which, you know, is a very, like, spread out, sprawling, um, you know, not really metropolis, but it's, it's, you know, it's a big, it's a big city, a big area, um, and there really wasn't a sense of community there, and there really wasn't you know, a whole lot of music scene going on. And what music scene there was, was like really heavy and aggressive and kind of aggro. And, um, and that was pretty much it, you know? It was like very punk, very metal, okay? And then when I came to Gainesville, 
uh, the very first time I came to Gainesville, you know, I, I didn't even know Gainesville existed, okay? This is like <laughs> 90, 96, I think I came uh, here to visit, you know, for for college. Like, I was, I was like, okay, a bunch of my friends are going there. I'll go check it out. And I had family in Ocala. Um, my grandparents lived, and my aunts uh, and uncles lived here in Ocala. And, my, and so I visited Ocala all the time as a kid. But, you know, you're like in the middle of the woods over there. Um, they, they all lived in the, the, the forest, uh, uh, National Forest over there. And so, but I had no idea that Gainesville, you know, was 45 minutes <laughs> north of there. So, so we, we came, I came here. I remember we just drove through, like, the university area. And I saw all these, like, brick buildings and, and um, you know, all these people walking around on the, on the street and stuff, on the sidewalks. And it just was, like, you know, something out of a movie to me. And, and I was like, this place is cool. It just has a completely different vibe. Uh, from uh, from West Palm, and I was like, I want to go here. This is cool. You know, it just it just gave off a really good energy, and um, you know, like I said, I just kind of stumbled into getting here, and it so happened. You know, bands I liked were from here. It all just kind of came together. Um, but yeah, so I th- I think a lot of people are drawn here because it is in a lot of ways like no other city in Florida. Um, you know, at the time when I came here. You know, there was really cheap housing, um, and uh, is it's very you know you can walk a lot of places, bike a lot of places. Um, you know, it's very what I found when I got here is that it was like very easy to get into the music scene and meet people. You know, you go to a show and you you, you might meet all the people in the music scene that that night. You know, <laughs> um, and 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 you you get to know people and and you introduce yourself to people and and um, you know, it, 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 you know, there was definitely a period of time for me when I was in college where I had, I had no friends, but I would go to a show and I knew all these people, right? And, and, it, and you know, it's a very comforting thing. And you're, you're surrounded by, you know, at the time, you're, I, I'm a whatever, 19-year-old college kid. Music's the most important thing in my life. And then you meet all these people and, and, and you don't know anybody else who's into the same kind of music you're into. And but then you go to this place and everybody there is into the same thing you're into, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, now a lot of people get that from Facebook or Twitch or whatever they're up to online. But at that time, that's how you, you met the people, right? And, uh, you know, I, I had never experienced that in a place, you know, in South Florida where I grew up. And so, and, and, and there, there were a lot of bands that had that same story they, you know, they came to Gainesville because the place where they were from just wasn't inviting. And then they came here and it was just, it was inviting and, and, and exciting. And, and there, I don't know, there's something in the water here. And like I said, a lot of it had to do with cheap housing. Um, mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then, you know, the, and the university, right? So you have all these young people uh, coming in, presumably open-minded people who are interested in going out and seeing music and, and you know, it, 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 so 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 there is something. There has been something special going on here for a long time. Um, that started in the '70s. You know, with that whole Tom Petty crowd. Um, you know, in the in the '90s, it bubbled up again with the Less Than Jake, the Hot Water Music, Sister Hazel, um, and then you know, and it, it bubbles up again in cycles. You know, uh, and, and and when I came here in the late '90s or '97. Um, you know, a lot of people, it, it seemed like the music scene was on a slow downhill at that time. And people talked about how, you know, there were so many bands and, and a lot of them, you know, and so many venues. And um, I feel like it's it's getting back to that area again, um, where there's a lot of different options and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I will say the cheap housing uh, you know, as as housing costs go up, and you know, I, I think they say Gainesville is still, you know, one of the cheaper places in Florida to live, uh, as far as you know, not rural. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, you see all these luxury student apartment complexes being built, and uh, you know, uh, you know, it, they're 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 pushing out a lot of the cheap housing where where you know people that were in bands used to live. So. Right now, there's, for instance, there's a there's a ton of kids in college making music, more than maybe I've ever seen in Gainesville. That's uh, going on right now, but 
not you know i think that 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 group that age group of people that it's like okay i graduated from college you know i want to stay here or uh and and continue to make music or maybe i didn't even go to college but i want to be here because i want to be around you know this this creative scene is there's it's harder i think for those people to find the cheap housing and be able to stay here and be able to to invest time in music because let's face it you know if you're a, a, a music a musician starting out and you're trying to do original music you know you're not going to make a lot of money you know yeah. uh, it takes it's a crapshoot whether you're going to find a following you have to play a lot of shows to to a lot of to a, to a lot of not people <laughs> uh, you have to play a lot of shows to nobody to before before you find a fan base and you know there's not much money in that so uh you know if if you if you know when i when i uh first graduated from college i was paying 200 dollars to uh to live in the garage basically for for several years and that's how i started my business you know I, my business was like a laptop and a fax machine i found on the side of the road and um you know in a laundry room next to a garage that i lived in <laughs> right um <laughs> you know i don't know how many opportunities people have for that right now in gainesville um it, you know I, it feels like less than it was when i first started um and and so that that kind of worries me but um I don't know if that was really your question, but I, I feel like it's all related. Yeah, you 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 definitely answered it. Thank you. It, 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 it's because college is you know college is tur- being turned into a resort, right? Yeah. College is, is yeah. not just like come to school and learn. It's like come to this uh, this resort theme park for four years and, and <laughs> live in luxury <laughs> with all the other rich kids. Yeah, come uh, come to this school that is now pretty much owned by real estate developers. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It, it, I mean, and, and, and you know, I, sometime in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I don't know when exactly it started, but yeah, these, you know, these corporations and real estate developers like realize like how much money there is for them to, to make, uh, to, to be made in college towns. And they just have slowly, you know, been uh, uh, swallowing it up, uh, you know, as time goes by. And, um, you know, I think that's to the, the detriment of, uh, of, you know, uh, a community like Gainesville. Like, I mean, there's plus and minuses, right? So, you know, I've noticed in the last, you know, we've kind of been open for 13 years. I've noticed that, you know, there, there are more people here. There's more business here. There, there are more people that are, like, coming here to live that are adults that have money to spend that isn't their parents' money or isn't from a, from a, a loan, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's where a lot of students you know, get their income. Um, and so that's good, but that it, there's also, you know, it comes at the, uh, the cost of more development, which, which reduces resources for creatives. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely what, what I'm feeling right now. Um, yep. as I'm, as I'm graduating soon. So, uh, but I, uh, I was wondering if you could sort of get back into your narrative um, around 2011. Yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah 2011, uh, I think it was like May, May of 2011. You know, the people from, from Common Grounds, the open, there were two owners there. Um, Nigel Hamm, who, who now works for the city and, and, and manages and books the shows over at um, uh, uh, Bodilly Plaza. Uh, and then uh, Jason Rockhill, who I believe he works over for, um, at the Woolly and the Top now. Um, but they were, they were running the, they were the, the owners of that venue and I'd worked with them for several years at that point. I was booking, you know, a lot of shows there and then they, you know, they said, Hey, listen, we're going to close. Uh, we think you're the best person to take this place over. Um, you know, because as a music venue, uh, in the most important thing is, 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 is being able to book, book the venue, like as much as possible. And uh, that was my, you know, that was that was my career. That was my job at that point. You know, like let's, you know, like like I, I, I you know, at the risk of not sounding humble, I was really good at it. You know, yeah. so, but I never, but I never uh, considered running a venue. Um, so I said, okay, well, let me think about this. Um, and on one hand, I was like, man, I don't know anything about running a venue, really, other than like what I've seen from 
the promoter's standpoint, but at the same time, this is, um, you know, this is where, this is my, my favorite venue in town, uh, where I do the, the most shows, uh, where my business as a promoter has thrived uh, by uh, booking shows here. Um, I, I kind of felt like I had no choice but to take it on. Um, and um, I essentially, you know, if you remember, I told you in 2008, I had uh, basically invested every dollar I had made into that festival. Yeah. <laughs> I basically went and did the same thing uh, with this uh, with this venue at the time. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to take all the money I have and I'm going to start this venue. Um, well, not, I mean... It, I start, I, we started. We, we we took over an existing venue, but we didn't buy the business. Right, the, the existing business was closing, but they also had a lot of things we needed. They had a sound system, and they had, uh, you know, all the bar equipment, and you know, just they had amassed over the course of seven years of being open, just all the things you need to, to run a, a venue and put on a show. And they had a, an existing staff that was already there, and so, you know, we. Well, when I say we. I, at the time, I brought in a business partner because I, I, I thought, well, you know, I don't maybe have, the, number one, the expertise, but number two, the, uh, the time to invest in, you know, running this place every day. And so I brought in a business partner, someone I, I had, uh, you know, uh, worked with um, a lot over the years and, um, you know, with the idea that, that they would be more um, attuned to doing the more, like, day-to-day uh, bar management stuff and that I could, you know, just book my shows. Um, cause that was my whole uh, goal. And it was like, I want to book shows. Right. Yeah. So, um, I brought in a business partner and, uh, we kept all the same staff from the, the previous, uh, business, um, which, uh, in retrospect was a mistake. Um, <laughs> but how, how so? you know, well, so, you know, uh, so Common Grounds, they, they had a, a reputation for being a little like, um, I don't want to say closed-minded, but they were a little snobby. They were like the, the kind of like the snobby punk club, right? Okay. They, you know, they they wanted, you know, if you were friends with them, they loved you. If, if, you, if you weren't, if they, if they weren't what you, what they considered like cool or punk, you know, you, 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 you got a kind of an icy reception. Um, and so, you know, one of my goals actually come in there was like, we need to, we need to, we need to change that. Like this place needs to be more accept, just more of a place where anyone feels comfortable coming here. Um, and, uh, I remember at the time, I think I did an interview with maybe the alligator or something and they said, okay, you're coming in you're going to run this place and what's going to be different. And I mentioned that in the newspaper, and that didn't go over well with the staff. You know, I said uh, we're gonna we're gonna be more inviting. We're gonna have better customer service, <laughs> and uh, you know that rust, that, that rustled uh, some some feathers. But um, it was it was true, you know. And um, over time, you know, all the staff, the original staff, had to go for different reasons. Whether they, you know, they quit or we had to get rid of them. It just it just wasn't the right fit. Um, and eventually, my business partner went because he, uh, it just didn't work out, you know? Um, so, uh, and we had many years uh, in the early days of that business that were really rough, you know? It was like month to month, uh, like, oh my gosh, are we gonna be able to pay the rent here, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that went on for, you know, many years. Um, but honestly, you know, once I got rid of, um, you know, the, all the old staff and I got rid of my business partner um, and, and I took, a, you know, I had learned a lot from that as far as like, okay, what needs to be done here to, to run this place? Uh, and I was able to like take, take more, um, ownership of, uh, of, of running it and, and knowing like, okay, this is how we're going to do things. And, and we're going to, you know, this is how we're going to, you know, um, uh, cut costs and, and, and those kind of things, uh, more control over like the bar pricing and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, that's when, uh, things started to improve a lot um where uh you know it started to become you know not a break even or a losing proposition but okay we can actually make a little bit of money here and 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 actually pay myself because for many 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 years i would say maybe six seven years i never even had a paycheck 
there. <laughs> you, so. were, you you were sleeping in the green room. Uh, no, well, that, that, that's that's funny because uh, people would uh, uh, would you know actually uh, my sound guy Oscar, who I think uh, you met. Yes. Um, he uh, he's been working for us since he was like 17, and when I first met him, uh, he was an artist. He was doing hip hop shows, and he came uh, into my office one day and said, uh, and he saw the green room, and he's like, "Oh man, this place is great." You know, do, uh, you know, uh, do you live here? <laughs> and uh, and I was like, "No, but if, if things don't turn out right, I, I could." <laughs> so, uh, but but yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time there. You know, never took a paycheck for a very long time. You know, just sustained by by booking shows there. That that's you know, which was my intention from the get go. So, um, you know, that that was kind of the transition. And, and actually, our, the the original name for High Dive was actually Double Down. It was called Double Down Live, and that was the first year or so that we were open. Um, that was our name, and then. Uh, we, uh, we got a, one day we got a, well, we launched our website finally. I think it was a couple months after we launched our website that, um, we got a cease and desist letter from someone who owned the trademark of Double Down, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in association with, with any, you know, live music, uh, or bar enterprise in the country. It, there was a, there was a Double Down saloon in Las Vegas. And then they had opened like a second one in New York, unbeknownst to me. And so when you do that, when you cross state lines, you have to get a trademark, oh, like yeah. a, you know, a national federal trademark. So, so yeah, so we got the cease and desist. We had to change our name, uh, and then that's when I came up with High Dive, um, which uh, you know was a catchy name, but yeah. you know it, it, came, it came to mean to me like okay, you know we're we're kind of a dive bar, right? You know, we're, we're, we're not, uh, pristine, right? We're not, you're not walking into the ale house. You're not walking into a cocktail bar. You know, you're walking into like a, a gritty place that has some character to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but at the same time, we want to be a, a high quality dive bar. That, that was, that's always been my, my goal. You know, we're, we're going to, we're going to retain the character, um, but we're going to do it at a high level. You know, we're going to bring in good shows. We're going to, uh, you know, do it right, which is important to me. And then, you know, so so we're the high dive. So it, it, it kind of had ended up having a double meeting. Yeah, I, I I didn't know that. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about 2020 and uh, what COVID did uh, to high dive. Oh, I mean, it, it was, it was, I mean, uh, at the very, I mean, it was rough. I mean, that's, that's putting it mildly. Um, so, you know, like I said, we had many years where, you know, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, we didn't make a lot, we didn't make any money. We were breaking even. And then maybe in, you know, the sixth, seventh year. So let's say, yeah, tw 2017, 2018, 20, you know, we're, we're starting, we're starting, things are starting to improve you know, to where we feel like, okay, we're really getting, uh, on a roll here. We're, we're getting better and better shows. The place isn't operating at a loss or a break even. We're actually making a little bit of money now mm -hmm. and, and all the hard work is paying off. And, um, you know, we had, we had done some, some renovations over time uh, on the, on the building, like kind of spruced it up a little bit because it had largely looked the same as it did when common grounds or the covered dish were there. Yes. And, and mind you, you know, I told you, uh, Covered Dish opened in 92, Covered, uh, and then Common Grounds opened in 2004, and and the place looked roughly the same. I mean, when we, when, when Common Grounds closed, and then uh, uh, Double Down slash High Dive opened in 2011, we were closed for, I believe, three weeks, and we essentially just, like, cleaned out the garbage, painted the place, and reopened, right? Mm -hmm. So... We did. We had done a lot. We had done a lot of renovations, new flooring. Uh, we we uh, we got this uh, fantastic. Um, it's like 120, 140. I don't even know how old it is. This this heart pine that we have on the walls. We had uh, we had uh, salvaged that from a, a building that had been torn down down the street. It used to be a, um, a train depot uh, on the corner of Sixth Street and Second Avenue. Yes. 
uh, I think there's an office there's an office building out there, but we had salvaged that wood. We had spent you know like a year you know preparing it and installing it on the walls. So we basically had uh, you know all new paint, all new floors, um, all new ceiling and walls, and we had spent a lot of time just making it our own and making it you know giving it our own identity, right? Mm-hmm. And and I would I want to say 2019, you know, was our was our best year yet um, at High Dive, and that's after eight years of of you know struggling and and, and making improvements and. Um, finally feeling like, okay, we have like a, a well-oiled machine here. 2019 is a great year. 2020 started off really well. Um, I think in 2020, you know, we, we booked Black Flag uh, in January of 2020, uh, you know, huge uh, show. Um, and, um, you know, things were, were just looking like it was going to be a bigger year, even in 2019. Um, so when, when things just came to a halt in, in March of 2020, it was a big shock, uh, to everybody. Um, you know, not just us, but I mean, everybody, I mean, it's, th- that, th- that whole situation could have completely destroyed the entire live music ecosystem in, in, across the whole world. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, and, 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 you know, we all, everybody that was involved in it, um, saw, saw that, right. Because we were immediately, t- everyone's told immediately to stay home and we'll let you know. Right. It was mm-hmm. indefinite. I mean, at first it was like, okay, this is just going to last three weeks or a month. But then, you know, after, after about three weeks or so, it was like, okay, now it's getting pushed back farther. And, um, I, uh, I was I, I, uh, I, I remember that when it hit right before our spring break in high school and uh, uh-huh. yeah every 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 kid and every teacher was like oh it's just all right I guess we're gonna get like another week of spring break and then right yeah, yeah we were so naive <laughs> right because uh, you know nothing like this had ever happened we you know you, you, we're, you're in this technological age you're just thinking this is impossible right well, if we look back on you look back on it now like if you'd asked anybody in March 2020, like, was that going to happen? People would have said, no, you're crazy. Like, it just didn't seem, uh, like, possible in the modern era. But, yeah, things, it just became very apparent, like, after a couple weeks where, where you know, we're closed. And we, we had all these shows booked into, like, the summer and the fall. Um, because, you know, as, a, as a, a venue that books, you know, touring artists, like, they're, they're booking farther and farther ahead. I mean, I have people, uh, it's April 2024, and I have people holding dates a year from now at our venue to book shows, right? Um, so at that time, we had all these shows confirmed, and, and you know, we're just, just to even cancel, like, a week of shows was, was like, whoa, this fucking sucks. Uh, <laughs> but then it was, like, weeks, and then, oh, we're not going to, you, you're not going to be able to open till May or June or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so everybody, you know, all of us that are in this business were just, I mean, we were, we were like, whoa, like, this is existential threat time, right? And I was on the email list with um, with uh, just, um, somebody I knew who I had met. Uh, they used to manage um, a band that I that I was a booking agent for when I had my booking agency, and they had some kind of like basically a PR company, and they did shows. You know, they, they did work with people over in overseas and and also um, here in America. And I think they had they had started something called. Um, uh, independent venue week, I believe is what they had started. Mm-hmm. And we had done that in, uh, in summer of 2019. And, uh, they, so they had this big email list of all these independent venues. And when I say independent venues, we're talking about venues that are essentially what you call like mom and pop venues. They're, they're, they're privately owned. They're not owned by a large corporation, uh, like live nation or AEG who are essentially the Walmart and Target of the live yes. music business. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, or the Walmart and Amazon, or however you want to put it. Mm-hmm. Um, the and bad so, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and they, um, so, so they, they had this big email list of people that were on this list, and they're like, hey, everyone, uh, we know the pain you're all going through right now, and uh, let's get together and talk about it. And they, 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 uh, got together this Zoom call where they said, 
hey, we're all going to get on at, you know, 2.30 on Thursday. And, and I think that the first one, you know, had maybe three, 400 people, whatever, on it. And everyone just was talking about just how hard this was. And very quickly, out of that, uh, the uh, National Independent Venue Association was formed, uh, which is short for NEVA, uh, uh, and well, or NEVA is short for that. And um, basically, it's just a big coalition of independent venues, um, just uh, trying to figure out, you know, what do we do here? And very quickly. Uh, you know, they decided, okay, we need to, we need to start campaigning for, you know, federal, um, emergency funds to, to deal with this. Um, and there was a very long effort that started in, you know, April of 2020 and went through that entire year mm-hmm. of, um, but, you know, it was, it was a grassroots effort that said, okay, we're going to first develop, we're, we're going to, we're going to first develop uh, okay, uh, you know, we all have these email lists and the social media accounts. We can reach millions of people. Um, and marketing is what we, what we know. Uh, we know how to get the word out, how to promote a show. Well, we're going to make sure all these people know that uh, we're in trouble. And if you want to see live music, if, you know, when this is all over, whenever it's over, we, we have no idea at this point. But when it's over, you know, this is pre-vaccine we're talking about. Yeah. Um, we, we, you know, if you want us to be here, we need your help. And we got a crazy amount of petitions through this huge effort of, of organizing, uh, 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 you know, music fans everywhere, live music fans. I think we got like a, over a million signatures to, to, to petition and lobby the federal government and say, we need, you know, emergency relief funding in order to stay open. And, and that was just, a monumental feat, and, and we were really involved with it on our end. I, w- I would say we were the most active, uh, we we're definitely the most active venue in Gainesville um, about it, and I worked really closely with um, the head of the Florida chapter of NEVA, a friend of mine who owns a venue in Tampa, and um, on one of those first calls, they said, hey, we want to get chapter heads uh, in, each, in each state. If anybody wants to nominate someone, and I nominated my friend Tom, who owned the Crowbar in Tampa, uh, because I knew he had had some like political experience. He had been on some like uh, community boards and stuff down in Ebor City, and I I nominated him. He got in touch with them. He became the, the kind of the the, the 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 head of the Florida chapter, and I worked a lot with him with lobbying uh, politicians. Uh, we we had calls with Marco Rubio uh, people, and and um, uh, who's the other guy? Rick Scott. Um, and you know, like the federal, you know, the, the the U.S. senator is like, hey, like let's get this pushed through, and eventually we were successful. Um, and in December of 2020, um, when they passed uh, one of the big COVID relief bills, um, we got I think it was was it 16 million dollars um, that they 16 million or 16 billion I can't remember at this point. A lot's happened, but. Um, we, we got a very large amount of money uh, to to go to all the you know the the booking agencies and the and the promoters and the venues that are all you know we're all tied up in all of this and not able to work for a very long time uh, so that we could you know pay our back rent all these things. Now, um, when I say that, I I need to tell you about like what the day to day was like yes. <laughs> at our venue, <laughs> which is that. Um, you know, it was awful. You know, we couldn't we couldn't work. Uh, you don't know what's happening. You know, for for I don't know what was it April and May, pretty much most businesses were closed in Florida. Like mm-hmm. no one was allowed to open except for what they call I don't know essential businesses, grocery stores, and um, you know I think restaurants were allowed to do to go type stuff. And um, um, you know, uh, you know people that. You know, plumbers and 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 that and construction, like you know, those are the kind of things that were allowed to, to be open. But bars bars were like the last on the list, and so we face we're like, okay, we have no idea when we're gonna, when we're going to reopen here, and you know, we, we kind of went into you know emergency mode where we were just trying to raise money any way we could. The first thing we had to do was put all of our staff on on you know, we, to say, hey, listen, 
you know, I mean, pretty much everybody that works at a music venue is like part time. But so we said, listen, everybody needs to file for unemployment because we don't have the money to pay you. Like if I, if, if, you know, if I paid you a couple more weeks, like we would have no money in the, in the bank. But so, you know, everybody's better off getting on unemployment. Um, and then, uh, you know, so, so at least the staff, you know, had some money, you know, to, to get figured out. But we were also doing like GoFundMe's for the staff. Uh, and then we were starting to just figure out like, how can we raise money to try to pay the bills while we're closed? Because we have all these expenses um, that we still have to pay while we're closed. You know, we still have phone and internet and, and rent. Uh, mm-hmm. Rent was the big one, you know? I mean, you know, rent's, our rent is probably higher. I mean, it's definitely higher than any other music venue who, in Gainesville. Who, who owns the, the building that y'all are in? So the building is owned by um, uh, uh, a guy, the guy who um, start, who owns the, the corporation, Five Star Pizza, um, because the very first Five Star Pizza started in our building. Um, oh, but, you okay. know, I was in St. Augustine. And he's, you know, he's franchised, franchised Five Star Pizza all over Florida and maybe beyond, I'm not quite sure. But, um, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's a well-off businessman, let's put it that way. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, and, but we, I mean, we really weren't able to pay our rent. You know, we said, we had a conversation and just said, hey, uh, we don't know what's happening. We're not able to pay our rent. Uh, and, and it was like, okay, we'll figure it out. But there really wasn't much communication from there. Uh, we just knew that we had to figure out how to, to pay our rent because we didn't expect it to be, you know, waived. And we had all these other bills. You know, GRU um, still has, you know, uh, even, if, even if you're not, actively putting on events you still have to you know you still have electricity and uh yeah. you know garbage and i mean we turned off as many bills as we could we, we you know we can we made things as, as lean as possible but there were still many thousands of dollars a month in bills yeah and then this rent situation that was looming over us and we had to figure out like how are we going to do this because it's not sustainable we can't do this for months on end and expect to to, to have a, a venue to go to, to operate when this is all said and done and still not knowing when when be able to do that. So, you know, we had GoFundMe's, we, we created T-shirts, we sold a lot of T-shirts, and, um, uh, you know, I, I designed them and got them printed and, and, um, and then, you know, packaged them all up in my house and, and mailed them off. Um, we, we, we did a GoFundMe that raised a little bit of money that mostly went to our staff, um, we, uh, uh, at one point, um, one of my staff members had the idea to, um, do a delivery service where we, we delivered pizza and alcohol. <laughs> and, um, so, so basically we set up a Google phone number where, you know, so, so, you know, just a random number that someone would call and then it would get redirected to my phone. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, I would, they would give me a, 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 an order and then I would call Five Star Pizza and place the pizza order. And then they, the rule was you had to also order alcohol. That way we, we made some money along with the pizza. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and so I would, I would hang up with them. I'd send them an invoice. They'd pay us over an online invoice. And then um, as I'm driving to downtown, I would call on the pizza order. I would go into the venue and I would uh, get the alcohol ordered together and then get the pizza and I'd have it all delivered within 25, 30 minutes. Um, and you know, I did that for a little bit and it raised a little bit of money, but I mean, you're talking about like hundreds of dollars, you know, it's not like (laughs) what what you need. I mean, it's not what you need to sustain a business, um, even a closed business. And, And that was the biggest problem. And that's, that was where we succeeded in, um, getting the federal funding ultimately was, we have these large buildings that have to be paid for, whether we're open or not. So we got to get some money here, or we're all going to go out of business. And we and, and we all had to really, um, uh, you know, push this idea to um, to 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 the you know to the to the Senate to the Congress that venues you know businesses like ours and venues like ours are very crucial to our communities because we bring business to everyone around us Mm -hmm. um you know on a given night where there's a couple hundred people at high dive they're not just going to high dive they're 
They're going somewhere beforehand, maybe afterwards. They're spending money on parking, on dinner, and um, they might be going out to another bar afterwards. You know, um, I forget what the, the stat was, but it was like, okay, for every dollar in t- ticket sales that we gen- that that we sell, there's twenty dollars more spent elsewhere in the community around us. Um, and so we're really like drivers of traffic into our neighborhoods, and and that was really what you know. Uh, once once people realize that, you know that that's what really pushed the funding. Because if, if if you know venues like ours had all gone away, there there you know it really really would have devastated the neighborhoods around us. Um, but uh, you know we, we we did that for several months of, of not really knowing what was going on and just trying to raise money uh, to pay bills, and then eventually uh, you know we were able to get some of the government programs that were you know slowly. Uh, the, the funding would come out. It'd be like, here's this paycheck protection thing. And, you know, you can have this money, but it has to mostly go to your staff. Um, mm-hmm. And you can use a little bit of it on your rent or you, your utilities. So then, you know, we, we would find something for our staff to do and give them some money and then take what was left to, um, to, to pay rent. But we still like didn't have enough money to pay all these bills. Um, and um, then, uh, in i want to say june of 2020 they said hey you can um you know bars can reopen um because it, bars were like the last thing on the list like they didn't want to open the bars because they knew you know people are going to get uh, be drinking and they're going to be social and then there's, it's going to spread more covid so they said okay bars can reopen and we were like but they said okay bars can open like tomorrow right uh, <laughs> but we're a music venue we're not just going to open our doors and then people are going to flood in. We have to, we have to book shows. And so I said, okay, well, it's going to take us like several weeks uh, before we can get open. So I, I remember I, I, uh, I set a, uh, a date, like I, I think it was middle of July. We're going to start ramping up. I'm going to book shows. We're going to have shows uh, starting in like middle of July. And at that time, while we have, while we had been closed, um, someone um, had approached us and said, hey, uh, you really should live stream um, from your venue. And we had started setting up the live, the live stream set up at the venue. And so we were all excited. We were like, we're going to have this live stream. Uh, but, you know, what they, at the time they were calling it a hybrid, a hybrid model. Mm-hmm. We're going to have this live stream. We're going to have our live shows. We're going to have limited capacity so that, you know, people can come back in and, and you know, with, uh, with, you know, we'll, people will be spaced out, all the crazy things that we were trying to do at the time to – stop the spread of COVID. Um, we're going to have limited capacity shows. We're also going to have these live streams so that we can have extra money coming in. And um, during that time frame that um, I was I was just working like crazy trying to, uh, to to book all these shows and prepare to reopen. And at the time, I, I even was working another job where I was uh, – a friend of mine had started a, uh, a, mobile, um, a mobile COVID uh, testing lab. Mm-hmm. Um, out of, like out of an RV, and he had a, a government, a state contract where he was driving around um, uh, doing COVID testing all over the state. And I been, essentially was acting as a tour manager for him. Um, <laughs> like, we were going, we were going from 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 city to city and setting up this uh, mobile COVID lab, and people would line up and get their tests. And and so I was doing that, and then so t- simultaneously trying to prepare to uh, to get our place, our venue opened. Um, and uh, then they announced, like, I think we were about to open, like, in a week. Uh, and then they announced, uh, hey, everybody, uh, too much COVID is spreading. We have to shut all the bars down again. <laughs> and so that was when things got really dark because we had, we had been preparing to reopen. We're, you know, thinking, okay, everything's going back to normal. And then we had the rug pulled under us from under us again and so then you're just like oh man what do we do now so we weren't able to have people come into the venue but we started doing these live stream events um just you know we would have we would live stream the bands and you know do these live streams and i mean i think we would get you know maybe like 10 people at a time would watch these things and you know i mean a lot you know the bands were all gracious they were donating their time but it just wasn't enough to sustain anything and we did that for several months, July, August. I think it was late September before we were allowed to have anybody in our venue. Again, you know, legally, 
um, oh. to like you know have people come in and you know buy drinks because as a live music venue that's where you make the majority of your money is drinks yeah um, um you know i pretty much uh went from uh you know mostly booking shows and and doing like uh uh you know behind the scenes office type work to now i had to be at the shows every anytime we did a show i had to be there uh because there was like all this responsibility extra responsibility of being open uh-huh. and making sure that you were safe and there was no COVID spread. Cause again, there was no, still no vaccine at that time. And, um, so it's like we were open, but you're still not making much money. And, you know, we, we, we luckily were able to, um, to get a grant to pay a lot of our rent, but we had to negotiate with our landlord to get a reduction in the rent. And, um, you know, we f- found out later on that, um, we almost got evicted, not even knowing uh, that our landlord was trying to uh, uh, rent it, our building to someone else um, so that they could evict us, but it, it didn't go through. So we were able to negotiate a reduction and, and use some uh, county grant funding that we got to pay our back rent and to kind of get a little bit back on schedule. Um, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> at least sustain ourselves enough even though we were still kind of we were digging a hole and there were a lot of bills we weren't paying at least we were able to pay our rent and our uh and our um our electricity to continue to be able to do these shows um and that went on for i would say basically from october of 20 of 2020 until about may june of 2021 we were just doing these like very low capacity events where um, we had chairs all spread out and you had to like sit in a chair or stand in front of your chair yes. inside our venue. Yes. We couldn't sit, put more than like 80 people in yeah, there. I, um, I, I, I remember very well these shows now that, okay. now that, now that you're bringing them up. <laughs> they were miserable. They were terrible. Um, I mean, it was, you know, people were, were excited that there was music on our stage and, you know, um, there, we had that and, you know, we, we were able to, like I said, not have to close permanently, but they were very miserable. And for me personally, they were awful because like I said, I had to be there every night and just deal with how miserable they were and, and, and have, you have people coming in that don't really want to follow any rules and don't want to wear a mask and uh, want to fight you about politics and stuff. And I often had to, I was the only security person and I had to be the person that was like kicking these people out of the venue. And, um, and then sometimes we would have artists that didn't want to, <clears throat> that didn't want to, uh, follow the rules. And <clears throat> then things got really hairy. And then there was a situation, <laughs> excuse me, we had a situation where we had this, um, this, this like hip hop group that was to- on tour and they were like these viral YouTube guys that just like to cause chaos and then get it on camera and then put it on YouTube. I didn't know this at the time, but they essentially came in, caused a lot of chaos, forced me to shut their show down. I had to, the only time I've ever had to get on stage and physically say this show is not happening anymore. Mm-hmm. And and then they all had it on camera and they were trying to fight us. And then we had to call the cops and stuff. It was it was very crazy. Um, but uh, you know, it really wasn't until May, June, July of 2021 that things started to get back to normal we started to get um uh you know touring bands coming again and that we finally even though december of 2020 was when this um federal funding had been passed um to say hey we're going to get money to all these venues that that you know need it um we didn't start to get that funding until july of 2021 um so, so really, from, from March of 2020 to July of 2021, we were just in an awful situation financially where we were just kind of cobbling together fundraisers and small grants that we were able to apply for that were, you know, very uh, difficult to apply for and qualify for. Um, and, uh, you know, so it, it, it was about 15 months of just, uh, bare bones survival and, uh, that we, that we worked through, um, mostly, you know, myself and then the couple of staff members I had, and I had a, a handful of people that were like volunteering their time, like my social media manager, who's been with me for gosh, maybe 10 years at this point. Um, he volunteered a lot of his time and, 
Um, I had some some interns here and there that volunteered their time just to keep our social media going and uh-huh. and um, help us uh, apply for grants and things like that. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was a, a very very difficult time. Um, and uh, however, you know, once things ramped up again in that fall of 2021. Granted, we dealt with a lot of stuff. You know, you dealt with people that didn't know how to behave out in the open anymore yes. <laughs> because they've been cooped up inside. Yes. And um, and and you dealt with, um, you know, we we went through, you know, the whole thing where um, they're, you know, they're, they're one of the most difficult things about that that whole situation was that the state of Florida was telling us, "Hey, do whatever you want. We don't care," which in theory sounds great. But then you have um, customers and artists and even staff that have different expectations, right? Mm. Some of them are all on board with the do whatever you want, and others are like, no, 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 like, we need to be careful here. And so we had to balance all those expectations. And, you know, there were, there were, there was, there were a lot of artists uh, and, and, and customers who wanted us, for instance, to do shows where you had to either have, you know, your vaccine card or um, like a, a negative test to get into these shows. So we did that for several months uh, from like uh, fall of 2021 into early 2022, where we had to um, do those shows. And, and, and some of it, in retrospect, was, you know, what you might call, a, you know, a theater where you're creating the illusion of safety, right? Yeah. Um, but you had to do it to make everybody happy and you know no one really knew for sure it's all just trial and error right i mean there were times where we were testing people's temperatures to get in and you know all sorts of stuff just just to to legitimize like hey we should be allowed to be open here because we're taking all the precautions Uh, because again um i have to remind everybody that the state closed our businesses essentially for six months but only our businesses there were so many other businesses that were allowed to be open (laughs) But bars and venues and gathering places, um, you know, were not because it was considered dangerous, right? Yeah. So, you know, for us to be open, we had to prove, like, hey, we're, we're going above and beyond because they'd already opened us and shut us down again uh, once. We, did, we didn't know if that was going to happen again. Um, so there was a lot of, a lot of um, extra precautions we had to take. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of masks we had to buy and, and extra clean supplies and all those things to just to, so everyone can feel like, hey, we're, we're doing this the right way. And um, that went on, like I said, for maybe about six more months, seven more months. We had all these shows where we, you know, certain, certain shows required it you know, or, or, you know, the bands come in, they say all the staff must wear a mask if they're around us, you know, all, all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, so on one hand, Things are, you know, people are very excited to come out, and we and and turnouts were, were great. We're getting all these uh, shows uh, coming back. We had, um, I, well, one one club uh, owner I know described it as the greatest hits. It's like all the all the good shows you ever had. All of a sudden, they want to come play for you again, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I, and so that was great. You know, we had some really big shows. We had two nights of Mayday Parade playing there in a row. And we had two nights of Flip Turn playing there in a row. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Amiga the Devil, he was another big show we had. And then um, Henry Rollins came. That was amazing. And um, all, these, all these shows. Um, but, you know, it was, it, was, it was still, you know, there was a, an adjustment period because you had, you know, crowds that didn't know how to behave. And then you had staff who, like, was like, oh, I don't know if I want to be around people anymore. And I quit right now, you know. Um, and, and so there were a lot of adjustments that, that took place there. Um, but, uh, I mean, we got through it, and, and I would say now, uh, in a lot of ways, like, just the live music business as a whole is in a, is in a much better situation. You know, they're kind of calling this, like, the golden age of live music because uh, people are just, you know, so excited to go out and see bands now. And, and yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I mean, we're, we're, a reci- we're, a reci- we're, we're a recipient of, of that, you know, um, uh, success right now, too, as, as being a, a venue that's been around now for 13 years, and and um, you know, a, a stat, an established place where people want to play. So, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, this will just be my, my final question. I know I know you've probably got a lot to do today, um, but 
sort of just looking at today, how is how is the high dive doing? No, I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I think, you know, things are, are better than ever now. Um, you know, uh, there was a lot of suffering uh, to get there, but, you know, we've been open for 13 years, and that, to me, is just a fantastic feat in a, uh, in a, in a city like ours. Um, you know, as I described, um, you know, there, it, 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 it was difficult for venues to stay open a couple years. And, and I worked at a lot of venues over the years that, that closed down. Um, and um, for us to be doing what we're doing now, which is essentially having, you know, different shows, um, in some cases, every night of the week, um, that would have been unheard of 20 years ago in Gainesville, Florida. Um, you know, uh, you know, so, and, and not, not only live music, but we, we have such a wide variety of events we do, which is, um, you know, burlesque shows and dance parties and, um, uh, sometimes we do sorority and fraternity rentals, private rentals, uh-huh. um, and, um, you know, live music comedy, we do a ton of comedy. Um, you know, we have, we, we, and we bought, we have, you know, a 150 chairs that we can put out and, and all of a sudden we're like a small theater comedy club and we've had you know really big names like Kevin Smith and Eric Andre and um, you know uh, Ralphie May who passed away but he played our venue and he's he was an amazing uh, live stand-up comedian we've had all these uh, big name co- comedians over the years um, as well as the live music uh, stuff and, and we've booked you know bands that I never would imagine I would have even uh, been able to work with like uh, Mike Campbell from um, from uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, uh, and um, uh, in a couple weeks we're going to have Sunny Day Real Estate, which is a band that you know I I grew up listening to in college, and uh, just so excited to have them. Um, but at the same time, we can also have a, a stage for local musicians who are just starting out um, to give them access to you know a professional live music venue, um, you know, uh, and, uh, and so I really enjoy the balance that we have. Um, I feel like we get to, to, to serve a lot of people. I feel like our building and our venue has, you know, going back to the nineties has always been kind of the, the epicenter, the heartbeat of the live music scene. Um, and you know, when, when I, and that was, you know, <clears throat> the a large reason why I, uh, agreed to, to continue that. You know, to me, it's a it's a, a tradition, um, uh, a legacy that uh, I felt compelled to continue uh, in this city, and I'm glad I did because uh, you know, it, to me, it's just crucial. Um, because when I first moved here, there was nothing to do here except to go see live music. Yeah. Okay. And and that's like all I wanted to do all the time. Um, now there's a lot of other options for people for things to do and a lot of it involves sitting at home Um, but you know we've been able to stay consistent in in this city for 13 years um, you know in a city that's changed a lot over that time period Um, a society that's changed a lot and I feel like we've um, adapted to that and we've grown and, and we've um, sustained and, and um, can just continue that history and that legacy. Um, I mean, that's what I'm, you know, the most proud of. Yeah, and I think, I think that the high dive has, uh, it's, it's remained a, a really great part of Gainesville. Um, oh, I'm glad to hear it. I mean, you know, if, if I didn't think it was important, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it anymore. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so that, that wraps up, uh, this interview. Um, thank you so much for sitting for it.